So cool. So uh, Philippe and Dan, thanks for taking time out of your day. I wanted to have sort of a re-education about open policy agent because Philippe, I know you had brought it up several months back uh, and I've had a few enterprise customers bring it up. Uh, it hasn't been a highly demanded feature, but I can certainly see the value in it. And so I think that it probably makes sense to restart those discussions about how we can maybe start iterating towards an experience that leverages OPA. Um, so I think what would be helpful is if, uh, if you could give us maybe kind of a high level overview and then we can maybe ask some questions around it and kind of go from there. Does that sound good? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so th the first thing that we have to clarify is what OPA means for compliance, because it can mean a lot of different things. You can use OPA as a kind of gate, but you can use OPA OC in live environment, like uh, cloud native environments. Uh, there is uh, something called Gatekeeper, where, um, for example, if you use uh, Kubernetes admission, uh, admission controllers, uh, you can intercept some request to the, the Kubernetes API and use OPA to validate the request before creating or updating a new resource. This is extremely far from what you can do within the pipeline, for example, to gate something that is not fulfilling your requirements or your policies. So I guess we need to narrow down the, the scope of that meeting to the, the second letter part so what can happen in the in the pipeline, for example? We can always broaden the scope later on, but I, I think we should start with that. Sounds good? Yep, sorry, Talk I think uh, Dan and I are just setting <laughs> no. up on notes. All right, thank, thanks for taking the notes. I've been doing that for the last two weeks and I can't feel my fingers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, I, so I, as I think I understood uh, your point, you're saying that we should try to narrow the focus of this discussion to like, what type of use case are we trying to solve for with it? Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Because OPA is absolutely agnostic. Mm -hmm. And um, if you take a look at the, the documentation, for example, there is a part with, um where's that integrating opa there's uh let me find this page for you the o ecosystem that will give you a good overview so i'm going to share my screen now that's going to be easier to talk to my point so hopefully you can see the opa opa sorry uh, ecosystem on my screen you can see that we have yes. a very very large variety of integrations so it's ranging from Docker, for example, where uh, you can define what kind of image you want to build, or it could be in Kubernetes, it can be in Kong. It's, it's most of the time related to, to Kubernetes, but it doesn't have to be that. It's very agnostic and you can do a lot of different things with OPA. So the things that I have in mind, for example, when, when it comes to compliance, and especially what we do at GitLab uh, is, having a kind of gate in the pipeline that would be very agnostic. So being able to define the rules that I want to enforce within my workflow in the SDLC with something that would write programmatically. So with a kind of code because OPA is using Rego under the, under the hood and Rego is kind of, it's not a programming language. It's more of a query language. So with that, you can think of Rego as a kind of SQL, it's, it's not too far from SQL, but you can define what you want to do with the input and what the output is going to be. And the output is always a decision. It's Rego R-E-G-O. And the beauty of that is with Rego, you can do a lot. Uh, it's an E, not an I, sorry. Rego, there you go. Cool, thank you. Um, the beauty behind this is it's limitless compared to a UI where you want to define the policy where you need to follow exactly what the UI is going to, to constrain you to. Rego is very powerful and, and, and very flexible compared to that because you can define functions that you can reuse in many different contexts. For example, if you want to say, I want to make sure that an admin is doing this or that, 
when we say admin, it could be a lot of things. But with Rico, you can define admin based on some input. Um, and I'm not sure, by the way, if you're aware of o OPA is, is working. So I'm going to share my screen again so that we can make that very clear. So that's the basic principle of OPA. You can have two different uh, ways of using OPA, but this one is, is the main one, where you have a service and the service is going to query OPA for a decision. It could be uh, a query on the live service, or it could be uh, something directly in the pipeline. Don't, you don't have to have OPA, for example, up and running in the pipeline to, to take a decision. It can be something very standalone. And OPA is going to take decision based on two things. Um, first of all, the, the policy that you define, so Rigo is uh, the, the language that I've been mentioning. So this is how you define actually the policies that you want to enforce. And you can have some data. And I don't like this schema that we have here because you have two sorts of data in, in, uh, in OPA. You have the data that you provide as a query. Like for example, if um, uh, I want to create an image and deploy that image in my pipeline, I want to make sure that this image doesn't have any critical vulnerabilities, for example. That's something that you can do very easily with OPA. That's, that's the input. So that's one side of the data that you, you can use with OPA. But there is another side of, of the data that you can use. OPA is also able to use some contextual data. Like for example, if you're in the context of a Kubernetes cluster and uh, you're using OPA as a gatekeeper, so you, you have a, an admission controller that is uh, controlled by OPA, and you want to make sure that you don't have two controllers or two pods of one kind. This is something that you can do with OPA. So the query in this case is, I want to create this new pod. So it's actually the manifest of the pod that you will provide to OPA as an input. The policy that you want to enforce is, I don't want to have two types of this, of this pod. So I want to block if I have another creation of this pod occurring in, uh, in Kubernetes. So I understand with just that, you're not able to take the decision because you don't know if there's a pod running with the same characteristics. And that's the other side of the, of the data that I was mentioning that is not part of the, of the schema that we see on my screen. So OPA is also able to query some external data. Like for example, um, there is an integration with Kubernetes was where OPA is able to query the deployed pods, for example, and compare that with what we want to enforce what we want to deploy. So we can compare, okay, we already have a pod with the same characteristics. There's a rule that is preventing that. We block, we don't allow, it's not even going to hit the Kubernetes API. It's going to be intercepted before that. So that's the, the, the kind of workflow that you can define with OPA. Okay, uh, so to, to interject for clarity, so I think at a high level, what I'm understanding is that OPA sort of sits in the middle. And so the middle being, I as the organization going to define uh, an open policy uh, and we'll call it, and it's done with this Rego language. And I'm gonna say, I don't want cat GIFs to exist in my uh, in this project or like in my production environment. So in order to enforce that, what happens is in the pipeline, we'll have this agent, this this policy that we've defined. And as the pipeline runs, it can we can have it call out to whatever systems or tooling is involved in this development process or this pipeline process. And if a cat GIF is found, it will measure against that policy we've defined and return some data that says, no, there's a violation here, which we can then action on as an output from that job. Is that right so far? That is absolutely right. I'm going to pass in the chat uh, a URL. That's the, the OPA Docker image that you can use directly in the pipeline. So you don't even have to use a kind of OPA service in this case, if you want to, to create this kind of workflow. So why would you want to have OPA in your, uh, in your pipeline? Because that's something that you can do with Ruby or you can do with Python or any programming language. The thing is OPA is um, 
built on top of Rigo and or it's not built on top of Rigo. It's using Rigo as the query language. It's built on top of Go actually. But Rigo is, I get a query language. It's not a programming language per se. So the adoption of that language is a lot easier than trying to say, I'm going to enforce everything with Python, for example. I've been discussing with some customers that were doing that. The problem is it, it doesn't scale at the company level. If you have multiple teams using multiple languages, as soon as you are hitting the limits of your, the perimeter of your teams, and you have one team using Python and the other team is using Ruby or C++ or any other technology, it's not going to, to work. And introducing a new language in, in, in a team is extremely painful, it's extremely costful, and they, they, they will never do that. So we have a lot of friction, a lot of pushback with adopting new uh, languages. Uh, but again, Rigo is not a new programming language. So the adoption is very easy and you can define things in a way that is extremely readable. For someone who doesn't know anything about Rigo, once you start reading the policies, if you don't have too many functions, it's pretty straightforward to understand what's going on and what you want to enforce in there. And you can reuse, again, this code in multiple places. Like you can define something at the company level. For example, we can say we never want because we have some regulations in place in the company, we never want anything to go through the pipeline with a critical severity uh, vulnerability. That's going to be a problem, obviously, because you know, security is never black or white. There is a lot of, of grays in the middle. So critical vulnerability might be a first positive, but if you are able to narrow down down to that to something that could be a very true positive then you have a gate in place and in any case if you have regulations in place even if it's a false positive you're not allowed to to deploy that until you say okay i have assessed the, the problem and it's a false positive so it's it's good to go so you can define that at the, the company level and you can refine all the policies at the groups and maybe at the project level to have something that is very specific to the project. I, I don't want any gift card in this, in this project because we had that in the past and that can't happen anymore. So you don't, know to, you don't need to know the project. You don't need to understand the technology in the project. You can define that with Rego directly. And again, it's, it's a language. So you can define whatever you want. It's very right. flexible. So do, kind of in your mind, um, you know, certainly, subject to change, right? But in your mind, how do you see this manifesting? Like if we say that, oh, this job sits in the pipeline, is it really just a job and the customer defines it and they're maintaining it like they would a, a YAML configuration or any other job rather? Or is this some like native experience we build in to provide this compatibility? Because why can't they use this today is I guess what I would like to understand. They can definitely use that today. And actually that's something uh, that we consider for the security team. They we wanted the security team to be able to gate new dependencies. Not because we want to control everything, but new dependencies come with a lot of new questions and <laughs> it's going to change completely the perimeter of the application. So we want to ensure that uh, the dependency is well maintained, there is no backdoor, we want to ensure a lot of things. So we're working on that. And we can use OPA for that. We can have, uh, for example, a list of dependencies that, that that's the current list of uh, of the GitLab project, for example, and we can put that list in Rego directly. And so if we have anything new that is detected by the, the dependency scanning job, for example, we can compare the result with, uh, with the list that we have. And if we have something that is not in the list, we know we have a new dependency. At that point, we can block and say, okay, we have something that is not uh, whitelisted. So we need to take a decision. Either we accept that or we don't accept that, but at least we involve the security team at some point to say, hey, we have something blocking the pipeline. We can go any further than that. The merge request is blocking because of this. What can we do? And the answer can be directly in the, the job output. So if we have a new dependency there. We need to assess that piece being the, the AppSec team to whitelist or, or blacklist the, if it's blacklist, then you need to find a, obviously a new dependency or, or something equivalent. But at least you have a way to 
block data to merge request. And it's in the form of a CI job, very simply, uh, using the, um, the, OP, the OPA uh, Docker image that I shared in the chat. I'm going to share my screen over again to make that very clear. So that's the kind of image that you can use. And with GitLab CI, you can use Docker images directly. So you can just specify, okay, I want to use this image. It's going to run OPA. Uh, you can have the Rego file directly in your project. That Rego file can maybe include some other files that would be at the group or the company level or that kind of things. And just by doing that, the output of the job will be um, a go or a no-go. If it's a no-go, then we can provide an output. The output is, again, extremely flexible. We can provide a JSON file, for example. We can provide text in the raw output to explain the decision. But based on that, we can use this uh, JSON output file also as an input for something that we would have in GitLab. That's something that we have discussed together, I guess, six months ago, um, where GitLab would be able to pass this file and have something very um, agnostic in the in the in place of this the, the current security widget, for example, we mm, could have something yeah. very similar. Then, okay, you have two, three violations of your policies. Here's the result. Here's what what you need to do to make your merge request pass. So right now, it's if you do that, you, you will have obviously a, a job that is failing. You will have that in the output, but it's. I think it's a bit hard today to um, uh, explain to the, to the user, to the developer, what is the next step in the merge request that is not passing. Right. It could be the pipeline, it could be a security gate, it could be a license gate. We have multiple gates at, at different levels, different places in the merge request, and we don't have, okay, you, you did, 90% good, but you still need to do this action, this action, and this action to get through your, your merge request. And if you see exactly this path in the future, you can anticipate a bit and you can see, oh, the last action is actually, I need to involve someone from the security team. So you can start pinging right away someone from the security team to say, I'm going to need you for this last step. Because right now what we do is it's blocking. So you unblock and then you block again on the next point. You, you have no visibility on the, the number of remaining points most of the time. So that's, right. that's a bit on something that we need to improve. Okay, so I think what I'm understanding then is, you know, customers can use this today and they are, and I think we're even using it is what I think I took away from that. But I think what's missing is the, the experience where GitLab provides some me mechanism by which to say, give us that that rego policy that you've defined so that we can ingest that information to um, both provide a list maybe for things like you've described for developers say hey like for this merge request here are the things that have to happen for this to succeed um, and then also show how that list is being progressed through as certain requirements are met so maybe some sort of like as policy, as the output is occurring from that Rego policy, ingest that to then update this widget in the merge request view to show them that data. Does that, I mean, that's a rough idea, but does that sound right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. There's one last thing that we haven't covered, one use case. And again, I'm going to share my screen to make that a bit easier to explain. Uh, the, the title is very generic. I'm sorry for that, but you, you will get the idea very soon. There is something that we could do as well. I don't know yet if we have some use cases, but talking to some customers, I have the thing that it, it could be useful for them. We could have a NOPA server running within GitLab. So we've seen that we can have OPA running in Kubernetes to get things. We can have OPA running in the pipeline. So it's not really running. It's in the, a server that is running. The job is uh, spun off. It's going to run and it's going to die. And you have the results and nothing exists anymore. Uh, there is this third option where you would have an, an OPA integration with GitLab with a server running that you can query. And you can feed this server with some inputs of any kind. Like your application would be able to query GitLab to see if 
uh, this user, for example, is able to do this or that and that. That's a very common scenario with, uh, with open, uh, the open policy agent. We're just facilitating that. Um, uh, in the shape of something that would be in GitLab. So you would have an integration where you could see, okay, my server is running, here's the rules that I want to enforce, uh, maybe the course or something like that. Like we have the registry, the Docker registry completely integrated into GitLab. This is something that is running on the side, but it's, it's very well integrated. You have the page, you can see all the images. So we can imagine that we would have something similar and that would be useful at the, the application level. So the applications that the users are deploying. If they deploy their application with the GitLab, they have this OPA up and running and, and immediately available that they can query instantly to take their decisions. Uh, that's that's a bit far from, from <laughs> the scope of this topic, but at least you have a very good overview of everything that you can do with, uh, with OPA today. Yeah, no, that's... That's a great point. I agree. Yeah, certainly far into the future, but um, valuable. And and I can think of what I hope are accurate ways in which we could apply that, not just to merge requests, but other applications as well. When it comes to, you know, the common use case of I want to know if my project is compliant. So being able to maybe define project level policies where we're not just looking at a pipeline, but like could we define what a compliant project looks like with OPA? And provide a mechanism to then report on that and give customers the ability to pull that policy against a certain project to say, is this compliant based on some standard we've defined? Um, does that sound like a feasible application in the future? Yes. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And again, I think the, the the main advantage of using OPA is this agnostic layer that you would add to anything related to policies in your projects. You have to keep that in mind. You, you can share a lot of things and define everything without going very deep in the project's technology. Like, again, if I, I want to ensure because my regulation is asking me to make sure that an admin can do this or that and that, the way you define an admin is not tied to the way you define that into our application. The application yeah. would be responsible of providing a way to OPA to understand what an admin is. So OPA is not reading anything but JSON. You need to provide JSON as an input. So you, you, you put the responsibility of providing the data in the right format you, you defer that responsibility to the developers, to the projects directly. Mm -hmm. And you can stay at your compliance level very high and say, okay, give me that and that. Like for example, the dependencies, the dependency gate. If I have the list of dependencies, I have, I can't just query the new dependencies with OPA. There is no way I can do that. But what I can do is just feed OPA with the results of the dependency scanning job, which is a JSON file in the end. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a report. So I can read this JSON file and extract only what I want. So I can go to packages, dependencies, et cetera, and extract the names. That's something that I, uh, I've been working on. There is a, a POC somewhere that I can retrieve. You can extract exactly what you want. And once you have this list of dependencies, then you can compare that. It's again, a query language, so you can do whatever you want. But I'm, I have nothing in OPA that will read a file that will open a gem file that lock and then do some crazy stuff. No, you just say in OPA, just give me the, the raw data. I want data and that's it. I want JSON and that's it. I, that, I can't query anything. That's why it's also so super popular because you, you have this abstraction layer where you can define things in the same way, whatever technology you are using. So if you have a Python project and a Ruby project, the OPA rules are going to be exactly the same. Right, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I feel we'll yeah get into those granular details, you know, in that future state. But I really like at least this um, shorter term goal, being able to to leverage it to provide primarily the visibility for developers, but then also this checklist and the merge request view because I mean that's a great evidence artifact if nothing else. Uh, but I so I see we're at time. Uh, were there any last comments or questions, maybe Dan, uh, you've been very diligent and helpful with the notes. So thank you for that. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, I am kind of interested in, and, and like maybe we can, maybe Philip, you can just give a real quick answer to this. Uh, does this Rego query language, does that effectively end up being pseudocode? Like how do we translate that to, you know, like let's use a very specific example. This project is compliant based on one policy rule, which is our merge request approval setup. We're, we're merger approval on this merger request, and you know, then it passes. Uh, I, I just, uh, I'm sure we could define that in Rego, but I'm wondering how we translate that to actually, you know, sort of retrieving that data from the GitLab context specifically. Like, how easy, uh, or, or I guess, do you have like sort of a conception already of what that would look like? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And that, that brings me back to the point where Rego or OPA is not able to do anything but take decisions. So if you want to query GitLab to get any data about the merge request, like for example, you don't allow uh, developers with, uh, within the certain group to create certain merge requests, for example, that's, that's the kind of policy that you could have. You have a portion of code that you never want to be touched by uh, any team other than this super high level team, uh, the team A, for example. So OPA is not able to do that directly. You will have to provide OPA with a JSON file that is presenting the data that will say, okay, here's the merge request. And that merge request that could be the representation could be exactly what the GitLab API is providing to you. For example, when you query the GitLab API, you get a JSON file in results, and you can query this JSON file pretty much like you would do with JQ if you know the, the JSON query, uh, this uh, CLI tool, you know, with the dots and everything. That's exactly what you would do with uh, with Rego. So you need to query this data, but you need to provide this data in the first place. So you need a script that will digest the, the, the API and everything that you want to, uh, to feed to, to OPA in the first place. Again, we defer the responsibility to the, to the project developers, to the, the, any developers. Okay. It's not okay. anything compliant to extract this data. The, the only compliance thing is to say, I don't want any, any other team than the team A to touch this and touch this it's again JSON, it's data. So touch this is the list of files that you have in, in the commit, the list of updated files. So if you okay. have a match with that and someone that is not in team A, yeah, just block. That's that's a no-go. Okay, cool. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So it I, I imagine we'll have some some follow-ups to this, uh, but now we're at real time. So Philippe, thanks as always. Uh, this was a very in insightful and helpful conversation. Uh, Dan and I will sync up and uh, be sure to follow up with you with what I'm sure will be more questions. Of course, if you need anything, please feel free to reach out uh, with me on Slack. We'll be happy to help with that. Sounds I don't good. have a lot of experience with Opal. But, but, but... More than us. <laughs> Cool. From what we I've seen, be... it's really, really promising. Yeah, I agree. Well, cool. Y'all have a great rest of your day. We'll talk later. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.